Welcome to CDF 2019. My name is Phil Jones from Sound United, and we are in the Sound United booth. And we're talking about something that is important for you as an installer, HDMI. And how do I get, how do I reliably send that 8K or HDMI 2.1 and all those fancy numbers from point A to point B? And joining me on, uh, on the stage today is Matt Murray from AV Pro Edge, Chief, Te Chief Technology Officer the big brain, and he brings big fancy test equipment, and we'll talk about that. And also, my buddy, <laughs> Brent McCall. How you, and you doing? you think I'm talkative? Wait till you meet this man right here. And Brent is in product development. We'll call it that. We'll call it that. So we're here to talk about, um, uh, there's lots of questions about HDMI 2.1 and its features, and what do I need to do to prepare myself um, in, for future compatibility? So make sure that when I do an install today, I don't burn myself in the future. So the first thing people ask about a lot is HDMI 2.1. So Matt, why don't you explain what are some of the benefits of that? So I guess, you know, I always will start by talking about HDR um, because when we went from uh, 1.4 to 2.0, all of a sudden we could support HDR, which was a whole new type of content that we'd never seen before. The whole system changed how we were making content. It was more relative to how we saw things in real life, mm -hmm. uh, more lifelike, much better uh, experience on that, that imaging device. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really great advancements in 2.0. Now with 2.1, it's basically taking it all to the next level. So you're gonna get things um, like higher frame rates, which uh, that's that's been something that uh, especially gaming community has been asking for for a long time sports community has been asking for it for a long time um, that's coming out AK obviously higher resolution but uh, one of the most exciting things I think from from my perspective because I'm a big like video junkie I love like good quality video and good quality HDR is being able to see the um, uncompressed chroma when you're dealing with deep color and and high resolution, high frame rate si signals. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna see a much, much better image out there. So higher resolution, higher frame rate, more color, more rich, more lifelike. Now, right. Brent, is copper dead because of all this stuff that's well, coming down actually, the pipeline? Before I get to that, I wanna address something because he brings this up. To me, the biggest change is the ability to go dynamic. So instead of looking at a single HDR setting for the entire panel, uh -huh. now we can get down to very small sections of the TV. So you can have very bright, very dark all over the panel now, so it becomes even more 3D-like. It is amazing what's happening. To the copper, strangely enough, that's just what we talked about in our presentation. Mm -hmm. No, it is not. Yes, now the big thing about it is, when we talk about more frame rate, and we talk about more resolution, there's only certain things that make a file bigger. Richer color does not make your file bigger. I mean like a bigger color palette, like you guys hear right. about, you know, Rec 2020 and all that stuff, that does not make your file bigger, or does not make the data bigger. If you add more frames, you add more resolution, or you add more color information, they call it bit depth. Right. That raises your, the size of the file. And what ends up happening, as the data gets bigger, the copper, the, the effectiveness, the effective length of the copper gets smaller, shorter and shorter and shorter. Absolutely. The original thought was at 2.1, we're probably looking at two to three meters of copper. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we know that with a little bit of help and equalization, we can get out even at 48 gig beyond 10 meters. Yes. So a lot of you times we do these retrofit jobs and they had an HD projector and you ran a you know 20 meter or 10 meter, yep. 15 meter HDMI, you swap in a 4K projector, big play, then you swap HDR, right. no HDR, because you just hit the bandwidth limit of that that piece of copper at that length. Yes. A little later, you brought some little toys that we could talk about to help you kind of retrofit and solve some of those problems. Now, besides copper, a, lot, a big thing is balance as, and also right. optical. So why don't we talk about the differences between those? So the, uh, commonly what's, what's being used right now for uh, video transport over long distances, there's, there's kind of three conventional methods uh, out there. You've got HD base T, everybody's probably heard of it. It's huge, it's over copper. Um, AV over IP is coming out a lot more. So those things are happening. 
Um, and then you have fiber optic. So fiber is starting to become, and in, in, in my world, it's becoming a, a lot. You know, we have matrix switchers now that are doing direct fiber. We're making cables out of fiber because it's the, the only feasible way we see to go long distances. But as far as the question about is copper dead, I don't know if it's necessarily dead. I think what's gonna happen is we're always gonna need to retrofit systems. Uh -huh. So you're gonna see additional ways to compress things. Exactly. So as it comes off of the baseband video, it comes out and then it's gonna have to be repacketized or compressed somehow to go somewhere. Yeah. Um, I know there's advancements where we're gonna see 18 gig over a uh, single cat cable. Uh -huh. um, I know that's coming in the very near future, but I think, um, you know, after that, once we start going 48, there's always going to be clever ways, clever ways to do it. Exactly. And we've got other packaging issues. When you look at HDMI up to 2.0, uh -huh. all iterations of it, even though there's four high-speed channels inside the cable, only three of them have been used for video at this point, D0, 1, and 2. Mm -hmm. The biggest change for us is turning on D3 yes. as a video feed. And unfortunately, the vast majority of cables and f even some of the fibers the first three are the only real high speed. That fourth channel has been treated as a clock. Right. So all it has to do is just tick along, basically RS-232 data. And if you don't have a high speed fourth channel, you're not moving in. The world's changing from the way we thought of it with a separate red, a separate green, a separate blue. Mm -hmm. Now it is an aggregate of RGB and clock mm -hmm. on each of those feeds. Yeah. So, okay, so like, if you think of it this way, eight, if you're a numbers guy, um, 2.0, if you want to do HDR, you have to have 18 gigabits. Right. Yes. And they ran six, six on this channel, six on this channel, six on this channel. Yes. Now you turn on the fourth channel, you're at what? 24. 24. And now if you, if there's some trickery to make it instead of six, 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 it's 12, 12, 12, 12. Right. You can get to 48 and ta-da. Well, so, that's, that's an, it's a good point you bring that up because inherently, you know, I, I've been telling people this for a long time. If you have a well-made 18 gig cable, you've got a 24 gig cable. Right out of the gate. Assuming we, that fourth channel right. is the equivalent of D01 and 2. Yes. And now there's some other things. Um, uh, like we, people are worried about the 8K thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I have, uh, I, I've had a lot of experience with that type of thing. So let's talk about um, what do you, like we talked about 2.1. Big thing is, of course you get HDR. Number two, you get um, you have the capability because you have more data. You can go down the pipe. You can do 4K 120. You can do 8K 60. Right. Um, those are great, but the first question is, where's the content? Right. So um, you may see 8K cameras, but let's talk about broadcast. Let's talk about a cable company. Right now, they won't give you four channel. They won't give up four channels to give you a 4K channel. They're not going to give up 16 channels to give you an 8K to give you an 8K right. channel. It's not a good business model. The next thing is the studios have 8K cameras, but the distribution in the movie theaters is 4K. So what's the motivation for a movie company to make that if I can't distribute that movie in the theater? What's the, what's the motivation of a TV company or TV station to make it, ABC, NBC, CBS, if the cable company will not provide that resolution? So a lot of times, the, what will probably happen is you will eventually start seeing 8K but the first thing is going to be video games. Video games yeah. So if your client is not a hardcore video game player with a gaming system the size of a small refrigerator, he's probably not going to be for a while. The 8K thing is kind of something of a peace of mind. I think, well, I think what they'll do is they'll capture the content in 8K, high frame rate, higher than 8K probably. Uh -huh. And then what they'll do in post-production is, or you know, they'll they'll water it down to 4K for now. Yes. And then have the content for later releasing it, re-releasing that, it. That's exactly yeah. what they're using the cameras for. Yeah, Buy yeah. once, cry once. I shoot it in 8K, I back it up. I produce in 4K. Right. Or I produce in HD. I can go back to it, because mm -hmm. once it's shot, you can't go back and reshoot it. Now, eventually, you may start to see the quickest way for a TV manufacturer to do it would be to make a streaming service. Right. Many of you guys think eARC is the devil. ARC is the devil. And I will tell you, if you don't prepare for eARC, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to sell an 8K TV, and the service is going to come out in 8K. And it's going to have to feed that back to your rack. And guess how it's going to go back to the rack? In ARC or well, eARC. It's, it's, it's a whole new host of issues because 
Arc. If not, no sound. So yeah. neither you love it, yeah. you gotta deal with it. And Arc, you know, that was always, there was a, a happy medium with installers and integrators uh -huh. and stuff because you could get most of what was on Arc. In fact, I think all of it over a Toslink cable. Is that correct? Or a piece of coax. Or yeah, so you could get it back another way. Uh -huh. Now with eARC, it's customers, consumers are demanding Atmos, they're demanding DTSX, they're demanding Dolby MAT, they're demanding these things, and they paid money for it. So you know we do have to figure out ways to yes. to give it to them. And uh, eARC is an efficient method. I mean, there's there's devices out there right now today that their input is accepting only ARC and new iterations are going to accept yeah. eARC only. So yeah, many sound changing. bars only are operated and controlled by by an, an eARC type thing. First thing we want to stress that um, there's very few TVs that will pass around through an optical cable. So this, if you choose an optical cable to send the data from that TV to that, to that receiver, you're going to get stereo, period. If you want multi-channel, Atmos, DTSX, IMAX Enhanced, all that stuff, you have to use ARC to get the signal from the, inter the TV's internal to your rack. If you want to do eARC, eARC gives you uncompressed audio, the same quality as a 4K Blu-ray. Right. So someone goes out and buys a $15,000 or $20,000 8K TV, and he's watching his 8K content, and it's encoded in Atmos, and uncompressed Atmos, and you say, no, you get stereo? That's not going to well work very well. They, the manufacturers, we can detach eARC and ARC from CEC. So all you have to do is take the audio portion of that. That's, um, so you'll notice that because you can detach it from the control, you can utilize that arc for that sound going back. You don't have to use it now, because right now all the equipment is in the rack, right. and you're just sending video to the TV. But eventually there's going to be some sources in that TV that you're going to have to send back to that rack. And if you don't prepare for that, the customer is going to be mad. Well, the, the CEC thing is very critical, because mm -hmm. under 2.1, the rules for CEC are going to change and you're going to actually start seeing some CEC info dumped on top of the video feeds. Mm -hmm. So you have got to be able to detach it for the audio mm -hmm. for that ER to work correctly. Yes. And assuming that your AVR, and I'm assuming because you are saying this, yours does this, uh -huh. <laughs> you can handle that because CEC is getting much more complex because under the rules of 2.1, there's a whole lot more stuff getting asked and answered than there was in the old days. It's becoming very complex on that channel and they've overloaded it already. Okay, yeah. so here's a couple things. The first thing is, if you buy a TV and, and you buy an AVR, make sure that it's ER compatible. Because even if a game, a game system comes out, Sony's working on one, Xbox working on one, they plug the game system directly into the TV and they send that one signal from the game system back to the sound system via ER and you leave all the rest of the stuff in the rack. The TV that you sold them, the AVR that you sold them will live on. The next thing is eARC, and um, besides resolution, there's some convenience features. eARC, um, which is audio return channel, enhanced uncompressed audio, and there's also things such as auto low latency mode. Gamers like to play their video games, and when the PlayStation or the Xbox says I'm on and I'm a video game, the receiver will turn off its video processing to reduce the game lag, and the TV will turn off its processing to reduce the game lag. It's a convenience feature. It's also, doesn't that get, doesn't the latency continue to go down as you go up in frame rate? Exactly. So what you end up with is, um, uh, there's certain parts of 2.1, there's, Two, there's features that you have to have to be 2.1, but it does not mean that a 2.0B device cannot do it. So that's why you're seeing eARC on receivers that we've had for like a couple of years, yep. and then also auto low latency, which we've had on our receivers capabilities for more than a couple of years. So you'll a lot of those convenient features the customer can take advantage of now, but I'm t and most of the time if there's going to be an AK source, it's going to be in the TV and you can still take it down the line. And Right now, the big thing, when you look at the changes, there's very few 2.1 chipsets out there. Uh -huh. So it's not like you're going to go out and buy very a Very few, up. there's... Well, <laughs> there's a couple certified. of manufacturers shipping one or two models that do have 2.1 chips in them. Uh -huh. But when you look at all of what's going on here, 
Even with 2.1 at 48, we're not where people think they're going to be. Yeah. They're thinking 8K, 120, and 16-bit color and all these things. All of this is is a smorgasbord. You can get a little of this, you can get a little of that, but if you get this and that, you're not going to get that. Uh -huh. So you have to balance out the feature sets that you want. So you're not going to get 8K 120, but you can get 4K 120, and you can get maybe 12-bit color, and you can get maybe mm -hmm. some other things, but it's all a balance. Yeah, exactly. And 48 doesn't solve that. Everything. We need to go to 96. Yeah. Uh, we have a customer that is a, this, this wants the ultimate peace of mind, you know, Denon has the X8500, Marantz has the AV8805, where we said that in, and once the chipsets and all that stuff has been finalized, you'll be able to, the client will be able to take that piece and for a fee, once we determine what it is, send it to our um, facility in upstate New York and they can go in and they'll swap, they'll do a board swap. Yeah. And now you get the full 2.1, 48 giga, gigabit number um, switching and stuff. But right now, all of our receivers support eARC, and you can connect it to a, you'll, you'll be prepared for the future. Yeah, now, speaking of eARC, yes. I want to get back to the cables. One of the reasons why copper is not dead is copper passes eARC. Yes, right? it does. Do, does is there, a, there is no wireless HDMI distribution system that passes eARC. Zero. I checked. <laughs> okay. The next thing is most balance. If you're Cat5, HD base T does not pass ER. They figured out compression schemes to pass to take 18, shrink it down, sit it on the pipe, and expand it to 18. But, but there's very few balance. I think right. you have one yeah, that will do it. It's using, but you have to add additional components. Uh -huh. You know, it's not. It's definitely not an off-the-shelf thing yeah. you can do. So, so you can, so you can support some balance will support ARC. Does yours do ER? We have one that does it. Yeah. So, so first thing, if you ever supply, look for a Fallon to put or an HDMI extender, the first question you should ask, besides 18, is does it support at least ARC, so I can get surround sound back from that TV in the future. The next thing is better, does it support eARC? Right. Uh, and a lot of times when you look at Cat5 or HD base T systems, many of those do not. There are fiber solutions that will do it, fiber balance, where you use a um, fiber wire between the two that would do it. And you can do active cables, which both you yes. and you um, supply it. And what is this guy right here? This is a, this one is a brand new one. Uh, we're just showing it for the first time here. This is actually 12 gig per channel uh, on four channels. So this is a 48 gig, it's an actual 48 gig cable. And just like uh, you brought up the fact that there's no content, uh -huh. so we had to uh, haul in a Sony AK TV to our booth, and then we had to bring our prototype. Um, our company also makes test equipment like this. We have a prototype um, uh, 8K generator, a test generator. So we have that running at the booth, generating test signals um, through the cable to the AK TV. So we didn't want to just bring a oscilloscope and a you know a, a big protocol tester and and have the stuff you know showing you that kind of stuff so we're trying to show how does this impact in the real world so so how long is that cable this one right here is is 30 meters uh, we do these up to a hundred meters these cables so, so so the cables are coming the other thing too is um, a lot of times we're still struggling with 4k and this man is Mr. Wizard when it comes to um, taking that cable that's in the wall and making it live a little bit longer. Yes, sir. So, so talk about some of the pieces that you guys The goal is made. to keep life in what you've got. Uh -huh. Plain and simply, not everybody's in a position to rip the walls and the ceiling apart to replace the cables. Well, one, one thing, sorry to cut you off, but I forgot to mention this has fiber, the ter field terminatable fiber inside. Okay, so you so can cut it. It's yes. clear line stuff, just like he's saying, you know, you can take this, when, when this gets old, because the ultimate last job of every cable, if you've wired it through conduit, is to pull the next cable through. Yeah. So this cable, if you staple it to the wall, or whatever you're gonna do, you can cut the end off, you have four pieces of fiber. By the way, don't you staple your fiber cable okay. to the wall. Yeah. yeah. Just saying. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about some of these little toys. Yeah. So the first one I like, is you and, and, and people ask me all the time and the reason why I brought you guys here by the way is whenever the picture doesn't work they blame the black box the big black box the most expensive black box and 90% of the time the problem is not the black box it's maybe the wire in the wall I, I just want to say the phone calls we get are the exact opposite it's your cable 
Everybody, everybody gets, gets blamed. Yeah, everybody gets We're blamed. We're all pointing at each other. Hey, it's this guy. But um, so, so for example. However, the, it generally does come down to a connectivity issue, not a box issue. Yeah, right. so we can't talk about all the stuff that they make, but we'll tell you where their booths are so you can go explore all of their toys. So the first one, you say you pull a, a, a long piece of copper, a good piece of copper in the wall. And it worked fine for HD, and it worked fine for 4K, but the second you run Dolby Vision or you, or you run um, HDR, it doesn't work. You make a little box called an accelerator. What yeah, is the that GA1. Do? So basically it takes your passive cable and makes it a active. It makes it an active cable at a full 24 gig. Yeah. Because we already planned for the four by six. Yeah. Now, in his previous incarnation, he used to work for a display company. <laughs> and they had 18 gig displays and they had 1365 displays, but they're all called 4K. Uh -huh. And here's where it gets a little bit confusing because just you can do 4K at a little over eight gig. It's stripped down, but it's still 4K. 4K 30, no HDR, 8 bit color. Uh -huh. So it's 4K. But then you toss in 10 bit color or you toss in a little bit better refresh rate and suddenly you're breaking the 10 gig barrier or the 1365 barrier. Yeah stuff no longer works. So you have to have that additional headroom going forward. Yeah, because if you just talk to convince the customer to spend $400 on a 30 meter HDMI cable a year and a half ago, and then now you're telling them you gotta pull it out of the wall and put a new one in, they are going to kill you. So having being able to use that wire and continue its life is a good thing. Which is why I'm a passive fan. Okay. The other thing is there's different types of active cables. Yes, there Some are. Some active cables are driven by an outboard, plugging it a USB wall ward. So that five volts comes from that. Yes. Some of them use the the TMDS. Yeah, don't. Why don't? Well, what's the what is the product with the lowest margin in the entire system? The TV. The TV. <laughs> now, most people don't realize this, but the TV is actually responsible for powering the output section of the previous device by sending voltage and current backwards down the HDMI cable to the input of the previous device. This is already at low margin, so they're cutting everything they can cut. I don't care who the manufacturer is. And if you're a little weak on current, and if the voltage lags because of distance, you're going to drop down below what's recommended and you can wind up de causing deformation of the circuit board which damages the product. Well, let me give you even a better scenario. They use a good 5 volt. And what happens is along the, along, the along the way, after a few hours or a couple of days, that voltage goes from 5 volts to 4.5 volts to 4 volts to the point where it won't power the active cable. Picture goes off. You unplug the cable. You plug it back in, you'll see a little spark, and the picture comes back. That is a drift. So they make little toys like this, you put in line, so the instead of the TV or the display powering the cable, this does. So it just helps your reliability. So, so there's a lot of things out there. We can't talk about all their toys, but regardless of the cable you use, you need to test it. So his company, Meridio, makes a lot of different test equipment Yep. Um, which so, we use the heck out which of. Which everybody uses. Basically, they use it for calibration and also testing. So they have one that will send the signal and one that will test the signal. Tip number one, check your cable, check your ballon before you put it in the wall. All right? So take the lowest band on the totem pole, have him plug the cable into a test pattern generator and put a check mark on it. Have them take those two balance and, and, and connect the length of Cat5 you're going to use and have the low man put the thing on it. Because can imagine doing nine zones of a house and trying to figure out which of the, oh, by the way, if you run it through a distribution system, if one cable is bad, the whole system doesn't do HDR. And now you're spending a week trying to, trying to troubleshoot something you could have done before you left. So right. test your stuff. So I'm there's different throw levels. something on top of what you just said. Yeah. And I know he's seen it too. When you look at the back of a TV, all HDMI ports are not created equal. One port, even if I don't care what it says on it, will work better than the others. Certain brands, it winds up being a specific port because yeah. when you look at the inside of the circuit board, there's always one port that's basically a straight line to the processing chip. The least amount of timing errors. And when you look at HDMI, failure is because of accumulative action of many things tying together to cause it to step off the cliff. Yeah. 
So typically one port, and you want to find this out before you go to your job sites, Call myself, call Matt. He probably has a pretty good idea which one works. Well, too. we do, and I was, I was going to say not to go too far off the rails on this, but we we keep. Oh, a we're going to go off the rails. We always do. We we keep a list of every of every input on every model year, every TV from every manufacturer. We we pull the eated, we do tests on it. So we have a spreadsheet that literally says, well, if you have if you have enhanced turn on and you're an input number two. This is what the EDIT is saying it should do, and this is what it does. Mm -hmm. So we have integrators call us, and they're like, you know, all right, what what on this machine? What just tell me what holes to plug these things into? <laughs> you know, yeah, and so, all ports and are we, not created equal, and yeah. we can tell them. Yeah. So the first thing is check your cables. So there's a couple of ways. So so I'm going to tell you the easiest. Well, first thing, we'll talk about my solution, um, what we do at Denon and Marantz in a second. So the first thing, test uh, generators. So you can have a, they make one called a fox and a hound. It's a great piece. Yep. One's a generator, one is an, is an analyzer, and yep. you can do things like check the 10-bit, 12-bit, 18-bit um, frame rates, HDR, info frame generation. HDCP. But, HDCP. HDCP. But guess what? Now because of 2.1, you're going to need more stuff. So they, they used to have a system called the, what were the, the 6Gs? The 6Gs, those are still, uh, that's the HDMI 2.01, by far the uh, leader, the most popular one, because that's going in through uh, manufacturers and stuff, as well as integrators and things. So that one's out there. This, How much does that one cost? Those are, uh, I think, 3500 For the for generator the, and the analyzer. For the pair. For the pair. But yep. guess what, because of 2.1, you got this thing. What is that thing? So this thing, this is actually a really exciting piece. This is the first time we've been able to show it. We've been developing it for uh, uh, over a year at I'll this be point. Your, I'll be your, I'll be your model. Yeah. So uh, basically, what this is 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 it's it's not a full 2.1 generator, but it's got the 2.1 features. Um, some of the things we've worked on this with uh, Dolby, um, and we've got their codecs and stuff inside of here, so we can now test. Um, audio latency, so th there's a microphone that comes with it. There's a sensor here that comes with it as well. And, and some of the stuff you can do even with ARC and eARC and HDMI is get actual input lag, get actual audio latency from the time that it was generated. You can change, you can adjust the timing from when you're starting a signal. And so you can try to line things up so you know exactly what you need to do in your, um, in your system. This will spit out the exact amount of lip sync you need to adjust for yeah, in AVR. So you can verify your eARC, verify your bandwidth, verify your latency and everything else. Yeah. Now, of course, how much is this guy? This one's a little more, this is a generator only, no analyzer. These are uh, 5,000. Yes, so, so 5,000. And if you do a lot of jobs, this makes perfect sense. But we also have a solution as well. So on all of our Denon and Marantz pieces, we have a, a hidden menu that we hide from the consumers, it's called HDMI Diagnostic. Mm -hmm. So you should have a 6G, at least a fox and a hound, to check your cables. If you do not, all Denon and Marantz AVRs have this feature in it. You basically plug the cable into the monitor out and into one of the HDMI inputs, and it will run a diagnostic. Eat it, um, HDMI, um, bandwidth, everything, and tell you if that cable passes. So at least do that. We realize that, like I said, if there's a problem, our black box gets blamed. So we right. allow you to check your cables That's using our box. I so we can say, it's not us, it's your wire. Well, that's, that's a, when we talk about testing and troubleshooting, uh -huh. that's always part of the conversation, right? Is, is we can take it as far as we can. There's no, you know, none of the tools can take you and say, okay, you know, now your problem's fixed all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. What it does do is it will, it's like a detective having a magnifying glass, you know, it gets you, it gets you to where, okay, this is my problem component. Now, oftentimes it may be firmware, sometimes it may be um, some hardware change, sometimes it's not supported, you may need to call your manufacturer, but, you know, just like putting tools inside your stuff mm -hmm. so that the integrator can like figure that out without um, having to, go and get test tools maybe necessarily. Because exactly. not everybody great. can afford, or not. you can't give everybody on your team 
a, you may have one or two right. um, fox and hounds, but it's nice to know that whenever you're doing an install, the junior guys should use the receiver to test all the cables. That's so, the stuff you guys got to advertise. Yeah, you know, I know. We need to. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> but, it, but anyway, now, so a couple of things. Copper's not dead. Copper's no. not dead, but it has a benefit of doing. Art. I'm going to cover you on tech yeah. support yeah. here for a second. Because a lot of times it, what happens is by the time we get the call and Matt gets the same thing, these guys are so frustrated, oh, they're just trying to get out the door. <laughs> no, Tom's um, back there. He's, a, he's one of our support guys. I can't imagine. Come here, Tom. You gotta give, I got to give this one guy of the things, <laughs> One of the things we really want guys to do is to set up basically a spreadsheet, honestly, because you start doing things like they, they, you don't really remember what you've done. Uh -huh. right. So we're going to have to go through with you. Okay, let's start here. And as much as I would love to say, look, there's just an easy button, we hit it and it's fixed, there isn't. Uh -huh. There is very, very seldomly a consistent problem in the field yes. because every job's slightly different. Yes. So we're gonna have to ask questions. You know, you, you may not get it on the first call. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we will, most cases between Matt and I, if you can call the two of us, yeah. I can promise you there's a pretty good chance we're gonna solve your problem. So, so let me give you another Mr. Wizard thing that you can do with a Denon or Morantz AVR. So we know it has HDMI diagnostics built in. Mm -hmm. But say you have also installed smart remote management, Domaltz, Oversee, um, something like that. Yep. You have full control of that receiver. The customer says, it was playing when I had, uh, it was playing when I had the HD signal, but now I got a 4K Apple TV, it does not work. I can log into the receiver from remotely, using my phone, eating my hamburger, and I can actually go in and I can make sure that the, pro the receiver set to the proper mode. Then, if it still doesn't work, I can tell the customer, take the wire, take the wire, plug it in this way, in the this input and this input, and run HDMI diagnostics remotely. And then look at the settings and say, your cable does not pass, um, does not pass the thing, you need a new cable. Or, here's Brent's number, you need, a, you need, a, you need an accelerator <laughs> or Matt to figure out what we can do. It's not our black box. So the goal is to make it easier for you guys to troubleshoot and cover your bases. So there's a few things I want to cover on the way out, because we could talk for an hour. Yeah. Number one, copper's not dead. Get a good piece of copper. There's ways in many applications, a good piece of copper will be good for a very, very long time. I encourage a DPL certification. We are, but there are other companies as exactly. well. Exactly. Um, By the these, way, his tester is DPL certified. Both of these gentlemen offer great solutions. I'll tell you which ones are some of the best solutions and why. The next thing, um, uh, if you do have copper, look for or an HDMI cable, and it's just not cutting the job. There are solutions to expand this capability and get a little bit more out of it. Um, cover your bases. If you pull wire, pull a piece, pull the HDMI, pull a couple of Cat fives, and pull a piece of fiber. If you do that, you'll be okay. Right. Okay. Um, the next thing. Don't be afraid of arc. If you don't plan for eARC, it's going to come back and bite you. Because eventually, there's going to be a source in that TV, you're going to have to get back to that rack, and no one's going to want to buy a $10,000 TV and a $20,000 sound system and not be able to play the 8K streaming device source that's in that TV didn't you through say their the same, home theater. Didn't you say the same thing in your previous job? Yes, I did. Just checking. So the benefit of being on both sides of the business is all this stuff has to work well together. Right. Our cables, the cable, your cables and your solutions have to work with my AVR, which has to work with that Sony TV right. or that Samsung or that LG. And, it's, and if not, the customer's not mad. They normally, like I said, blame the black box or you, the installer. So we're trying to make sure that they don't yell at you because when they yell at you, they yell at me. Right. And I don't want to get yelled at. I don't think Tom wants to get yelled at that either. So now, general things. HDMI as a specification really isn't. Yes. Part of the problem we face in most cases is DDC based. It really isn't going the distance on the picture and the sound. That they've got figured out is the who are you, what are you, what's your resolution. And that just refers back to an old Phillips standard from uh -huh. the 80s. HDMI does not even have a standard written for that. Exactly. And that can create problems for compatibility. That's one of the reasons that black box exists is even you know some of the, like the movie servers Kaleidoscape, which is a phenomenal product, but they have a different EDID voltage requirement. Mm -hmm. And active cables, most anyway, don't work with them. Exactly. 
And now also in the receiver on the ACMI diagnosis, we also have the ability to adjust EDITs as well. So all this ah. stuff we've learned from working, from working closely feature. with you guys. Um, we try to make it as compatible as possible. So um, as well, we don't have time to talk about video distribution and things like that, but if you go to both Brent and Matt's booths, they both talk about um, balance, um, HD base T, um, multi-zone matrix switchers, and they can provide you with a lot more information to make sure that you are prepared for the future of HDMI. So Matt, where is your booth located? 739, so we're back in the kind of corner over there. Yes, and they have, like, like they said, they have test equipment, they also have um, different cable options, um, video distribution, matrix switchers, and, uh, and, a, and a lot of other variety. And then, Brent, where are you located? We're at 1338, which is actually on the same line with him. Yeah. Okay. If you've seen one of us, you've seen the other of us. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and he has all these cool little tools to save your butt. When, when, uh, when you forgot to do something or it just isn't doing what you need it to do. So I like to call him Mr. Wizard because these little things like this can solve a lot of problems. And you can go in and if you talk to these two, you'll, you'll be amazed at how many quest things you struggle with that they can give you an answer in like five or 10 minutes. And at least for us, tech support is available from 8 a.m through 10 p.m., seven days a week, Eastern Standard yes. Time. And like I said, we also have a, a tech support te um, team, um, Tom and Mike. They are there specifically for custom integration to help you um, work through your video and your audio issues. The, um, their lab, they have basically not only all of our products, but, but all of the different video devices from Apple TVs to Roku's, all of the cable boxes, all of the I, all of the ISP routers. So we want to make sure that if you have a problem, you can call us um, and make sure we get it done. So Tom's here, Mike couldn't even come because if somebody has to be there answering the questions because you guys are still doing jobs. So, so hopefully you guys got something out of this session and feel free to come, please come by and visit our booth, which is 30, 3108 and see some of the great um, devices and receivers and we'll be happy to talk more about HDMI diagnostic mode in our uh, in our receivers because many of you do not know that it exists. So thank you very much for your time and I will talk to you soon. Thank, thank you. you.